In this video, I present what I think are the five most important things for you to know about ancient apocalypses, beginning with number five and working our way down to number one. Number five. Ancient apocalypses are not primarily about the destruction or the end of the world. If you were to ask someone on the street to picture in their mind an apocalypse, they would likely think of images like these. The landscape is barren, vegetation is overgrown and taking over the asphalt in a busy city, and an iconic human-made structure, like the Statue of Liberty, is destroyed or in a state of shocking disrepair. The word apocalypse in modern parlance is about destruction and the end of the world. This is largely due to post-apocalyptic film and television, from which many of these images are taken. In these cases, some catastrophic catastrophic event has ushered in the end of the world and a small band of survivors are trying to put things to right or they're simply trying to stay alive. This modern connotation of the word is not necessarily wrong. We use the word apocalypse and apocalyptic to refer to destruction, damage, and catastrophe as in these entries in the Oxford English Dictionary. The first definition explicitly mentions the New Testament book of Revelation, which is perhaps the most famous ancient apocalypse. The definition states that the book of Revelation describes the complete and final destruction of the world, and there is destruction and catastrophe in Revelation and also in other ancient apocalypses, but this is not necessarily their defining feature. Instead, they have a constellation of several different defining features, all of which may or may not be present in any given apocalypse. The first entry in the Merriam-Webster dictionary better captures the, captures the ancient connotation of the term apocalypse. One of the Jewish and Christian writings from 200 BC to AD 150, marked by pseudonymity, symbolic imagery, and the expectation of an imminent cosmic cataclysm in which God destroys the ruling powers of evil and raises the righteous to life in a messianic kingdom. This definition notes the following three features of ancient apocalypses, pseudonymity, symbolic imagery, and cosmic cataclysm. We'll return to these features and others in just a little bit. For now, the important point is that when we think of ancient apocalypses, we need to set aside the modern notion of apocalypses that are popularized by film and television. While many ancient apocalypses do have a dose of disaster in them, their primary purpose is not to describe how the world ends. The word apocalypse in Greek literally means unveiling or uncovering. Preachers commonly say that it was the word that referred to a bride lifting up the veil from her face to show herself at her wedding. This idea isn't necessarily wrong, but it is a bit overwrought. The idea is more like lifting up the curtain of history to see what's going on backstage, how spiritual things are working behind the scenes of history, of what is seen in front of us. So apocalypses are about revelation, and in fact, in Greek, the word apocalypse very often gets translated revelation, and this is why the last book of the New Testament is called both the apocalypse and called revelation. One of the most important Greek dictionaries of the New Testament, called BDAG, indicates that the word apocalypse means making fully known and should usually be translated revelation or disclosure. When we turn to New Testament texts in which the word is used, we can see how this is the case. In Galatians chapter 1, Paul writes, For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that was proclaimed by me is not of human origin, for I didn't receive it from a human source, nor was I taught it. But I received it through an apocalypse, through a revelation and unveiling of or from Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1.13 says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Discipline yourselves. Set all your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring you in his apocalypse, that is, in his revelation. Apocalypse is then something that Jesus Christ gives to his followers. In Luke chapter 2, it states that Jesus' salvation is a light for apocalypse for non-Jews. That is, it's a new revelation, it's new knowledge, an unveiling of something new to Gentiles. And finally, in the very first words of the book of Revelation, the apocalypse is something that God gives to God's servants through the servant John. It again is a revelation or special knowledge, but here it also serves the function of indicating what kind of document follows. Revelation falls into the generic category of apocalypse. 
and this is because apocalypses were a familiar ancient literary genre. Just as we are familiar with the genre of post-apocalyptic film and television or science fiction literature, many ancient people will have been familiar with the apocalypse genre. While there are only a handful of apocalypses in the Bible, the genre is attested more widely in the ancient world, especially in early Judaism and early Christianity. Whereas gospel was not a literary genre with known features and forms, when the first gospel, the Gospel of Mark, was written, when the book of Revelation was written, the apocalypse genre was known. The writer of Revelation had a script to follow, or at least certain features of a genre that could be included and modulated. The classic definition of an ancient apocalypse comes from John J. Collins. He writes, an ancient an apocalypse is a genre of revelatory literature with a narrative framework in which a revelation is mediated by an otherworldly being to a human recipient, disclosing a transcendent reality which is both temporal, insofar as it envisages eschatological salvation, and spatial, insofar as it involves another supernatural world. To put this into more basic terms, an apocalypse is a kind of story, a narrative, in which a human being has a trippy vision that's revealed by an otherworldly being, usually an angel. The vision usually contains one of two things. The first thing is a group of symbols about what's happening with the world's empire, usually with the promise that the present empire is about to fall. The second thing involves showing the human being, during the vision, what's happening with God in the heavens. Embedded in this definition are a number of features or elements of an apocalypse. What makes a genre a genre is that it has a constellation of features that are recognizable to that particular genre. Not all of the features need to be present to make a discourse a recognizable participant in a given genre, but several of them do. For example, we recognize romantic comedy by its lighthearted and humorous tone, by two people falling in love, by a series of misunderstandings and comedic situations that create obstacles to their relationship, by quirky supporting characters, and usually some kind of happy ending where the protagonists live happily ever after. Similarly, horror films are identified by suspense, scenes that make you jump, eerie settings, supernatural or monstrous antagonists, and often a final climactic confrontation where the protagonist faces the source of terror. Not all of these features need to be present to make something a rom-com or a horror movie, respectively. But when several of them are present, we know what kind of genre we're dealing with. The same is the case with ancient apocalypses. They possess several, but not necessarily all, of these features. A human seer or visionary figure who is usually an individual from the ancient past. The seer has an otherworldly vision, revelation, or journey. They, these individuals often will predict the past as if the past were the future. This is what is called ex eventu prophecy. Following this successful prediction of the past, they will often then predict the near future from the writer's perspective. Apocalypses also have rich symbolic and trippy imagery, and because this imagery is weird, an angel or multiple angels or otherworldly figures need to interpret it or serve as a guide if the seer is going on a heavenly journey. Number two. There were two main kinds of apocalypses, one involved heavenly journeys and the other symbolic visions. I've already indicated in our simplified definition of apocalypses that one of two things usually happen in an apocalypse. Either the human being, the seer, is taken into heaven and allowed to see what's happening there, or they're given a vision that reviews historical events through symbols. I want to show you an example of each of these while also pointing out some of the generic elements of apocalypses. If Revelation is the Bible's most famous apocalypse, then Daniel chapter 7 is probably its second most famous apocalypse. It's easy to overlook the fact that Daniel is a figure from the ancient past, both for us, but also for the audience of Daniel. The book of Daniel is set in the Babylonian period, around 550 BCE, but the book was written during the Hellenistic period, around 167 BCE, the time that Antiochus Epiphanes defiled the temple in Jerusalem and attempted to force Hellenization upon Judeans. So Daniel 7 already has one of the main features of apocalypses, the central figures from the ancient past, from about 400 years before the text was written. It'd be like me writing a vision that George Washington had during the Revolutionary War. 
And the Daniel has a trippy vision is another clear element of apocalypses. His vision famously involves four winds bringing in four different beasts from the sea. Four is a favorite number in apocalypses. The four beasts are like different creatures, but with monstrous features. A lion with wings, a bear with tusks, a four-headed winged leopard, and a beast that's different than the ones before it that's not compared to any particular known creature, but has sharp teeth and ten horns. Each of these beasts is ultimately destroyed, and a human creature, a non-monstrous creature, is given power and authority from the Ancient One. The figure Daniel understandably doesn't know what's going on here or what any of this is supposed to mean. So, as is characteristic of the apocalypse genre, he asks an angel to interpret the trippy vision in Daniel 7.18. The angel explains that the four beasts are four different kingdoms and implies that the non-monstrous figure, the one like a human, often translated one like a son of man, are the holy ones of the Most High. Those are the ones who will receive the kingdom. They will be the ones who ultimately rule and are in charge. While the angel explains the basics of the vision, he does not explain the specifics. But these could be easily inferred in Daniel's historical context. The four beasts were meant to represent four different empires or kingdoms, and the angel tells Daniel as much, and these were the empires under which Israel and Judah had been subject. The human figure was then meant to represent the Jewish people, who would have their own kingdom and authority once again. So with Daniel 7, we have many of the main features of apocalypses and one of our two main kinds of apocalypses, a symbolic vision that reviews world history and makes promises about the near future. With First Enoch, we have the other main kind of apocalypse, a heavenly journey. Again, it's easy for us to overlook the fact that Enoch is a figure from the ancient past. In this case, it's because he's largely unknown and not celebrated in our world as he was in the ancient world. Enoch was the great-grandfather of Noah, so he lived in the mythic ancient past before the Great Flood even happened, and is notable because he didn't die in the usual way, according to Genesis. Instead, Genesis 5.24 says that Enoch walked with God, and then he was no more because God took him away. This has led to several interpretations from both the modern and the ancient world that Enoch was taken directly into heaven, and so also has, this has also led to apocalypses being written that explain what exactly it was that Enoch saw when God took him away. In 1 Enoch 14, which was written around 150 BCE, close to the time of Daniel, Enoch reports what he saw during his sleep. But Enoch's vision here is not a bunch of different beasts. Instead, it's a vision of heaven. Enoch is taken up into heaven in his vision, and as the chapters of First Enoch progress, he's given a privileged view of the different levels of heaven and what's going on in them. By describing what heaven is like to Enoch in his vision, the audience also gets a peek into heaven. First Enoch is then a good representation of the other main thing that happens in apocalypses while also containing many of the generic features of an apocalypse. A figure from the ancient past is given a vision while being accompanied by an angel and he goes up into heaven. And number one, apocalypses are often literature of crisis concerned with judgment and hope. There are two more characteristic or features of apocalypses that I have not yet mentioned in my list. These two have as much to do with the context in which apocalypses were written as they do what is in the apocalypses. First, apocalypses were written in contexts in which the present circumstances were not all that great. Usually the person or group that wrote the apocalypse, or the group for which they were writing the apocalypse, were facing some kind of suffering or persecution, and this suffering and persecution might be actual and real, or it might simply be perceived. And it's in this way that apocalypses are literature of crisis, they're literature of the oppressed. And this is why apocalypses so often use violent, dramatic, and catastrophic imagery. It's one thing for a dominant group to claim that violence is coming to the people. It's another thing for an oppressed group to claim that violence is coming upon their oppressors. And apocalypses usually promise that there will be judgment and vengeance. This judgment and vengeance is meant to lead to future hope. The present evil reign will end and God will soon put things to right. 
all will be made as it should. And for the writers of the apocalypse, all is as it should be when their group has peace and when their group is in power. We find then that the apocalypses are written in times of crisis and they promise future hope. Daniel is written when Jews are facing forced Hellenization or Greekification, and Antiochus has just entered into the sacred temple and defiled it by looting it and erecting an altar and making sacrifices to the Greek god Zeus. Daniel promises that the final beast with its haughty little horn, Antiochus, will be destroyed and a non-monstrous empire, the Jewish people, will rule in its place. To Ezra, also known as For Ezra, is written in the aftermath of the Roman destruction of the temple in 70 CE and promises restoration and the temple's rebuilding. First Enoch addresses what it perceives as the temple's defiling by the priests that are in charge of it and promises that the wicked priests will eventually be punished and the righteous will be vindicated. And the book of Revelation is written when some Christian groups are facing issues with both the wider Greco-Roman population and with Jewish synagogues, from which Christians were beginning to separate themselves. Revelation has particularly violent imagery reserved for the Roman Empire, and it depicts a near future age when the saints and not the beasts will be the ones who rule. So these apocalypses are all tied together not only by the fact that they share common generic features of apocalypses, seers having visions, special knowledge and insight being given in the vision, and the vision being interpreted by an angel, but also by the fact that they are meant to offer hope in the midst of crisis.